This afternoon, we're going to begin our session by discussing macro or systemic risks, and then we're going to drill down into portfolio risks. So let me begin by introducing our distinguished panelist. To my far right, we have Myron Scholes, Professor Emeritus at Stanford University Graduate Business School. We've got Laird Landman, Group Managing Director of TCW. We have David Solomon, Co-Head of Investment Banking at Goldman Sachs. And we have Vlad Portnoy, Managing Director of Jefferies Investment Advisors, and Jane Buchan, CEO of PAMCO. So David, let me begin with you. In the US, the ratio of market cap to GDP is close to the highest it's been since the 2000 bubble. It's 125%. At the peak of March 2000, it was 136%. The world market cap is up 190% just from March 2009, while the world GDP is up only 23% over that same time period. Do you feel that this is in bubble territory? Do you see build bubbles building up in other markets due to the ultra accommodative monetary policy that we've seen over the past couple of years? And what's your advice in terms of managing these risks? Well, first of all, it's nice to be here. Thank you for, um, for having me. Um, that was a bunch of questions for a short couple minute answer. But at a high level, you know, it's, very, it's hard to predict bubbles in markets. Um, I think the thing that's interesting about the way you phrased the question is you started pointing to a, bunch of, to a bunch of market metrics as a question with respect to risk or bubbles or excess. And you know, I do think that raises an important point that will be the underpinning of, I think, what a number of the panelists will talk about. The world today, from a financial system perspective, is much safer, safer than I think it was a decade ago. But one of the issues that comes with that is there are a variety of things that probably make markets more susceptible to volatility or to shock than they've been over the course of the last 10 years. With respect to the equity market specifically, I don't feel like the broad equity markets are in a position of being in bubblish territory. Um, bubbles are always very easy to identify in hindsight. and They're very hard to identify until they happen. That's why they're bubbles. Um, but you always tend to look for places where there's a lot of excess, where there's a lot of leverage. Um, and where there's a general sense of the fact that, that it's different in some way you know, this time. And so you know, I don't look to the equity market for that. I do think that certainly negative interest rates in the world, a tremendous amount of monetary policy over a long period of time, certainly is having an impact on the way people manage risk, the way markets are set up. And I'm not smart enough to tell you what the repercussions will be of that over time, but that's that's probably one of the places I'd be most focused in thinking about where the repercussions of some action could lead to something that we can't easily anticipate. Larry, talking about negative interest rates, about 30% of the global sovereign bonds are now trading with negative interest rates. Pensions are underfunded. Insurers are vulnerable to asset liability mis mismatch. What's your advice to asset managers? And in particular, what steps can liability-driven asset managers take to mitigate these risks of being underfunded? Well, I think the liability risk that you point out is, is probably one of the biggest risks we face as a society uh, and we face in terms of the markets. Uh, I was just watching the global pa uh, panel and they talked about you know, Putin's strategy. He plays the long game. And we never seem to play the long game as it relates to risk. And when we think about David's comments just a moment ago about you can't predict bubbles, but you can think about the framework of our central banks right now. They're trying to play through. They're trying to keep this cycle going for as long as they can. And it does seem, I, I, any of you, any, anyone who has children of the millennial generation, as I do, uh, it does seem there's a lot less tolerance for risk and pain than there used to be. I may get attacked after this panel for those comments, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll stand by them, having experienced it. And it seems like we're trying to prevent the credit cycle from ending, the downturn from occurring, and that's naturally, we're trying uncharted territory with central bank policy. It will have unintended consequences. It affects our banking system, mm -hmm. which is the transmission mechanism uh, for monetary policy. It infects, ins it, it, it uh, infects would be a good term, but it certainly hurts insurance companies. We're seeing a lot of our uh, clients who are in the insurance business come and look for slightly more aggressive solutions in terms of meeting their asset liability needs. 
We strongly encourage, in terms of risk management, thinking about the long game, which is that central banking power, the, you know, the, 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 the ability to play through here will end at some point. At that point, if you were the person who let the Fed, let the central banks encourage you to take too much risk to meet those liabilities, you're going to pay the price on the other side of this. So while I think they're, 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 they're making it look very comfortable right now, I think you want to basically be very disciplined as an investor. And that's the essence to us of, of good risk management. So David, you said you can't predict bubbles in the equity markets. Let me, uh, let me ask a different question, uh, given your capital markets um, background. Uh, the clearly, and sticking with the negative interest rates, clearly the cost of debt has never been lower. And uh, corporations are taking advantage of this by relevering, which is something that concerns me. U.S. corporates had a net increase in outstanding debt of about $2.5 trillion just since 2009, even though they've had net free cash flow of over half a trillion dollars. And so, of course, as I said, this debt is uh, issuing to retire equity. We've also seen uh, corporations not investing. 2014, 90% of earnings went into um, buybacks and, and uh, dividends, and in 2015, preliminary numbers look to be the same. Do you think that these policy responses, certainly the central banks that are uh, issuing so much, uh, you know, doing so much QE and so on, are actually helping to reduce the risk in the system, helping to generate uh, economic growth? Or do you think it's just shifting risk from one place to another and uh, laying the seeds for future problems? Well, the, 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 the conclusion, because this is the cycle, the, historical, the historic cycle of the way risk in markets work, whenever you react to an event in markets, you're laying the seeds for what will be next, because we're always, we're always looking through the rearview mirror at what happened and not anticipating the way the world will evolve. So there's no question that we're doing a variety of things that are laying the seeds for other speed bumps, crises, potholes, you know, depending on to what level you look at them. You know, corporate balance sheets, I think, are in pretty good shape at the moment. Um, you talked about an increase in debt uh, to some degree, but when you actually look at corporate balance sheets, and this is a broad generalization, I think corporate balance sheets are in relatively good shape. And one of the things that the crisis did was it put a sense of cost discipline into, into corporations broadly that actually allowed them to come through that process healthier from an earnings perspective, even with subpar growth or substandard growth, which is what we've, um, which is what we've seen. Um, but generally speaking, I think if you look at the other side of it, what this monetary policy has done is it's forced investors to reach for yield and extend duration in order to pick up fixed income return. And I think people understand intellectually what happens when interest rates do change. And I'm not a believer that we're going to have negative rates forever and low interest rates forever. We, we will one day wake up and be in a different world. You know, how people respond to that when they actually get into that environment, how markets are surprised or not surprised by that, I think can lead to volatility or issues. And that's certainly something to think a lot about. If you go back to 1994 and you think about monetary policy, the Fed keeping interest rates really at 3% for three years, and then over the course of a year between February 2004 and February 2005, really raising interest rates by 3%, it caught the market enormously by surprise. And that led to a series of reactions that created quite a bit of pain. And so, again, I'm not smart enough to say where it's going to come, but you look at the way this monetary policy has changed behavior, affected the way people manage risk, invest, and look at the world, and you know that at some point the unwind of it you know, could lead. There's the potential. It doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. but could lead to some issues. Warren. David said that uh, he thinks the corporate balance sheets are in good shape. I think it's true. That was, that's sort of the point. But they are taking that uh, good shape, and they are relevering. In my mind, they're buying back a lot of equity. What do you think about that? And, and do you think that's uh, sort of a dangerous thing? Well, I mean, obviously, there's the consequence of taking on more risk, obviously, is that if you lose your cushion, you lose your ability to have security against uh, shocks that could occur, and then uh, basically, obviously, uh, leverage is a two-edged sword. You know, you make money on the upside, but you lose more on the downside, and so that has uh, uh, consequences. Now, um, if it's the case that uh, central bankers and the government uh, is convincing people that they will not allow the markets to go down, or they're really worried about the markets going down, then it, uh, I think that's what encourages more risk-taking, is the fact that 
Um, if <laughs> I have four kids, and if uh, I never want to get four calls on a Sunday, even though each of my kids knows that I'm there to support them. <laughs> That's an interesting analogy there. Uh, Vlad, so uh, interest rates can clearly stay for an extended period of time very long, low. On the other hand, there is a risk that um, we'll be surprised that the Fed could actually um, normalize a lot faster than people are expecting. How do you think that investors should uh, construct a portfolio looking at sort of both sides of this um, coin? Well, again, nobody can predict uh, if it will happen, when it will happen. It clearly has to, but we don't know when. So I think from the asset allocator standpoint, um, you know, there are many ways that people do asset allocation and construct uh, you know, dynamic, strategic, and so forth. A lot of these uh, techniques have some underlying assumptions, and uh, they uh, are really highly dependent on the, what happens in the raising rate environment, and nobody really knows what happens in the you know, prolonged zero or negative rate environment. So in particular, uh, one of the things that all of the risk models sort of rely on is the relative uh, you know, volatility ratio of, uh, let's say, take the two most you know, major asset classes, stocks and bonds. Um, bonds have traditionally had lower volatility. And so in the context of asset allocation, that's a leveraged position. Um, and uh, so what happens when the correlation breaks down, if it breaks down, if the stocks and bonds become uh, positively correlated on the way down. We've seen some episodes and some evidence where that already happened in uh, 2013, taper tantrum, and some of those uh, episodes were very painful uh, you know, to portfolios. So uh, while you can't really predict when it will happen, having a portfolio that's resilient and uh, you know, where leverage is prudent and can react to regime changes is, is very important. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the insightful part there is nobody knows when it's coming. Nobody, in our opinion, can really predict the future course of interest rates. These are uh, stochastic variables, and uh, you have to think about it, about the cycle and the long game, as we were saying. And you have to be set up before, because with the liquidity in the markets, uh, particularly fixed income in the condition they are now, you're not necessarily going to get the ability to change it after the fact. Um, I had. Uh, one of my favorite risk management stories of all time was a model failure called portfolio insurance, and it related to basically markets gapping. And I worked with a practitioner and a famous academic at a large Wall Street firm. And when the crash came in 87, uh, I happened to pass him in the hallway, and I asked him how he was dynamically hedging his portfolio. And he was going to use futures. And he looked at me and my colleague and said, futures are just too cheap right now. I can't possibly bring myself to sell them. And the gentleman I was with and I looked at us and just said, oh, this is over. And I think that that is the same with the portfolio structure. You have to be disciplined beforehand. And I do think a change in regime will come. I don't believe we're going to be, as uh, I think David said, uh, in a negative interest rate uh, regime forever. And when it comes, the asset prices that look reasonable today are no longer going to look reasonable in that new regime. And so again, prepare for the long game. He should have uh, believed the futures market prices. If he had believed the futures market prices, his portfolio insurance and his thing would have worked. He, did, he thought the stock market prices were correct, and they were not. That, that may have been it, but it was over. Well, it's actually interesting, because I think the average American got wealthier in the crash of 87 because they were over-allocated to bonds, and bonds actually went up. So stocks were a minor portion of the portfolio back then. That's an interesting way of looking at it. The 87 crash was a good thing. OK. So let's switch to um, macroprudential uh, regulation. Myron, recently the Fed and the FDIC released the results of the bank's submissions of their so-called credible living wills. Five out of the eight banks failed. For two banks, the FDIC and the Fed couldn't even agree. The FDIC said that Goldman's living will was not credible, while the Fed said that it was. On the other hand, the FDIC said that Morgan Stanley's living will was credible while the Fed said that it wasn't. Do you think that the regulators are focusing on the correct things in building the macro models, given their worries about macro prudential risk? I think I got all that because of the, <laughs> the <laughs> but um, OK, let me try. The, um, actually, the interesting uh, part about uh, 
bank supervision as the Federal Reserve, the central banks generally have, are trying to do too many things with too few instruments, uh, basically uh, trying to control inflation, try to control growth or have growth in the economy, trying to worry about these so-called uh, asset bubbles and, uh, and exchange rate. But for a long time, they thought about um, uh, their microprudential rules, which is actually thinking about um, a bank supervision as each individual bank. And lately, in the last number after the crash, or the difficulties of 2008, then they've thought maybe we have to think about the banking system as a whole and not just the idiosyncratic risk of one bank. So what we have in our general, just the general proposition that there are idiosyncratic risks which are individualized, risks associated with a particular investment or a particular business, but there's also a beta risk, or, and beta risk is so important in the economy as that, uh, and we're, we tend to ignore it or have ignored it over time, and even today in investment people are really ignoring the, um, the beta risk component. But uh, the interesting thing is that really the day-to-day -day correlations that we have and we talk about, if you watch CNBC or others and everyone's talking about all the movements that we have are really not the most important thing. And we all realize that tail correlations and tail risks are really the biggest thing that, are, uh, that affect uh, risk in the, um, and risk in the economy. And one of the interesting points, we have shocks that occur, then all growth assets uh, tend to move together. So correlations that we thought were going to protect us don't, and everything goes down as we saw in, and that's credit assets, debt assets, um, and equity assets as well. All safety assets tend to move together, and also all inflation type assets tend to behave as a class and the correlations become very high in each of the asset classes. The interesting thing about correlations and risk or in, uh, in a macro prudential sense is that, and as said earlier, is sometimes bonds move uh, negatively with equities as they did in 2008 when we have a, a flight to quality, okay? Uh, growth assets go down and, and safety assets go up. And, Inflation assets might do what they want at that time. Sometimes we get inflation assets being negatively correlated or positively correlated with growth assets. Uh, in stagflation times we had in the, uh, in the 70s. So the interesting part is when the tail correlation, the tail risks all become very large, then um, we, can't, we have to think about not only how risk, but how risk propagates across the various classes and how uh, correlations in the tail among tails among the buckets uh, tend to uh, be handled. And so the Fed really is trying to think about how to handle, or central banks are trying to handle these risks, or systemic risks as they're called, but just as correlations become very uh, uh, large within these asset buckets. So the problem is that most of the macro models that are used to look at crises don't look at crises at all. They are all based on normal times. And normal times don't mean anything, OK? Because you just get volatility or normal volatility. Whatever. Ignore that. That's not what's important when you have a shock. It's really these correlations that occur in the tails. And, so, and history doesn't give us enough information, because you can look at five times or 10 times or whatever history. And, and history is different today from what it was in the past. And so. Uh, they try now to think about all these regulatory rules and constrictions that they have on particular segments and sectors and living wills and all the rest of things. But who knows what they are constructing has anything to do with how the tail correlations are going to occur in the future or how shocks are going to permutate. Because finance is dynamics. The distribution of returns and risk and correlations are not constant over time. They're always changing. They have to have forward information, not rely on the past. And uh, markets really, in my view, are the only dynamic answer to know what the future is going to be about risks. And this is the most amazing thing to me, is that the Fed and other central bankers do not believe markets are going to tell them anything about risk, which is amazing. You know, they just completely deny that the markets are going to tell them anything. And if you listen to Bernanke or you listen to others about the 2008 crisis, 
They said, we saw no, nothing about this. You know, Kaskari is talking. Today he says, there's no information in the markets or no information I had okay, that told me there was going to be a crisis. And that is nonsense. You look back in 2008, the markets, the levered markets of the world were screaming that risks were increasing, screaming that risks were increasing. And um, they don't use that information. So interestingly enough, the leverage markets tell us things. If you look at the stock market, the stock market doesn't tell much about risk alone because it has growth rates or growth and expectations of cash flows, and it also has discount rates. So you have one price and two pieces of information you have to know. But there is a, uh, a huge markets out there that do tell you about risk, and that's the option markets. From the option markets are pure risk markets. And we know that if you want to buy insurance against a hurricane in Florida, when a hurricane is forecasted to coming, be coming in, the price goes up, right? And the price goes up of that insurance. The same thing is true in the options markets. And if you looked at the options market in 2008, it was telling you there was crisis there. Even if you look back at the data in 1987, at the time of the crisis crash you were talking about, uh, to the options market were giving us information. So the point is, what I'm trying to say is that we now have options traded in over 4,000 securities around the world. They give us forward distributions of risk, and, it, and they also give you estimates of what the tail risks are and how the tail risks are correlated among the banks and other financial sectors. If the Fed really wanted to buy information cheaply and not incur all these costs, they can just go to the options market and build their models, which are all forward-looking, and give you better estimates of future distributions of risk than, and beta risk and how beta risks are changing than actually all the data that they're using and all the, all the past macro models that they're using, all the macro models which only use historical data and use historical distributions, which they assume to be constant and unchanging. So I think there's huge amounts of information in market prices that can be used to give us information about how risks are changing, how correlations are changing, and those could be used in a, uh, to uh, by uh, the government uh, and also by others in deciding on effective risk management. So you would say then that we're not any better off in terms of all the risk models that they are coming up with in terms of you know these so-called stress tests. I mean, I think in fairness, they do use some of the uh, forward-looking, um, forward curves and other kind of forward-looking uh, indicators when they look at the stress test. So what do you think about, um, you know, yeah, do you think that we would have, that they, I agree stress, totally. Stress tests are wonderful if you have the complete set of stress that might occur. Well, of course. But, but how do we get stress tests? We use the past to say these are things that didn't work in the past. Let's test them now. But it's the a point. It would, it would be fair to say, okay, that the banking system is not a place where at the moment there's a high degree of probability that something's going to go really wrong because what's happened as a result of 2008 and the crisis and all the things that you're talking about Correct. is that we've taken a lot of risk yeah. out of the banking system. So the regulators in that context have been very focused on that particular situation and leading to the comment you made yeah. before, that moves risks or creates implications for other markets and pushes risk into other places. An obvious one, someone mentioned before, liquidity, a lack of liquidity in markets. One of the implications of all of this, which has taken a lot of risk out of the banking system, is it's creating a lot less liquidity in markets. And but that has an know, implication. We can know what market risks are, as I'm trying to say, by using what the market is forecasting risk to be. And we don't know exactly where they are in flows or institutionally, but if you want to know where the risks are, or, you know, as your words are bubbles developing or whatever, you can tell because then the, the risk, the market, the distributions are telling us in the forward distribution where tail risks and tail correlations are increasing. But behaviorally, economists hate to give up like that and just rely on the market <laughs> forecast. But I do agree. I, I wish we, you know, we're, we castigate markets, but my view is if you throw out market information, well, that's crazy. Of course. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But they've been doing it, and if you look at the Fed's forecasts that they've had since 2008, everyone has been wrong since then using these types of models to look at 
basically what the risks will be and how the economy will grow. And it's typical that uh, we always fight the last war in risk management. And we're fighting the last war was the banking system, it was the housing system, it was right. where debt had right. grown the fastest prior to this. And I, I had the fortune of working with a very good trader when I first got in the career. And I said, I was all wet behind the ears. I said, where do I find risk? How do I understand it? He said, just look to where the most leverage is built up. Yep. And that's where your next battle is going to be. But we never well, do that. Let's bring Jane in in terms of the liquidity, because I think that's probably one of the big key risks that are out there. Jane, you want to talk about that in terms right. of both the bank side and also asset management? Um, I think there are a lot of big issues as a big investor in hedge funds. Um, I would beg to differ that the options market definitely have a lot of information, but they can be very wrong about the future mm -hmm. because what we've observed is the hard part about looking forward is you have to figure out how people are going to react in the future. And people adjust their behaviors and their rules to based on what they saw last time. And so you can see the fundamental way the market microstructure works is very different. For example, today, to be really specific, there's, um, we have tremendous concern because there's a tremendous amount of investment managers who have decided stop losses is the prudent way to manage a portfolio. And that is diametrically different bef than before 08. And so they're baking into their systems a tremendous amount of assuming there's going to be liquidity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you have the regulators and other people who have decided that prop trading and liquidity, market making liquidity are one and the same and they're evil. And so it doesn't matter what a security is worth, when you have to liquidate something, um, you have to find someone to buy it and there's no, um, I was talking to someone this morning about it and they used the word shock absorbers. Wall Street has lost all that mechanism. And the problem you've got is the large pools of capital today are the pension plans Many of them are in negative pay. They have money flowing out, not flowing in. So to say that they're long-term investors, when with cash rates so low, they're running almost no cash portfolios, they're going to have to sell and make benefit payments. There's just no way out of that. And there's not going to be anybody there. And the market-making system isn't there. So I think that's a real problem. And you know, from our viewpoint, you know, when we look at investment managers and investment strategies, you things that are based on stop losses or current bid asks or even going back and looking at 08, 08 was a really bad scenario to test your model in because you did have some big broad deep desks at that point in time and people weren't using stop losses to the same extent. And I think you're going to see a lot of disasters off of that. I mean, that's just our view, so. I'm not saying options markets are 100% right. No. I didn't say that. I'm Sorry. Sorry. I'd say if you, get the, if you have a forecasting market, the question is, is you have better forecasts than just using historical data? And I say, if you look at, if you look at all the empirical work, that it is a much better predictor than, because people are putting their money on the line, than uh, just using these historical models. Right, but I also am a big proponent of the market microstructure, and you have to look at, at who the players are and how those are, being, are changed in people's utility functions. And it's very much changed right now. Your point really resonates with me because whenever, whenever I hear people talking about some, when everybody's doing something that's different, it has a knock-on effect. And generally, until we have time to observe that knock-on effect under stress, we really don't know what the implications of it will be. And so I think it's a really good example. I'll just pile on one more thing. What you're talking about, stop-loss trading, is something we've always been very opposed to in that it's really just another form of that portfolio insurance that yeah. I brought up before. You're trying to replicate options payoffs, but you're trying to lower your delta to the, to the underlying by sort of cost averaging out uh, as, as you're getting worse and worse results. But that, those types of assumptions are built into a lot of the risk models that we use today, uh, particularly in value at risk. And uh, you know, really great practitioners know how to work around that, but at the end of the day, most of those reports end up in the hand of, hands of high-level executives at the bank and they just see a number at the end of the day that has to be corrected. And it sort of forces people to act as a crowd. And this behavioral failure uh, is a big aspect of risk management, I think, going forward, is figuring out you know, if you get everyone acting in a, a homogeneous fashion following the same model, you, get some really, you can get some really bad results. As you talked about, David, the idea that you know, we, the banking system is much better. We've done a lot of great work there. Yeah. Um, 
but we could get much. We could still get bad results in the market because you get these sort of uh, behavioral anomalies combined with leverage. I, I think Jane, your comment is very timely. Also, just based on the experience of the first quarter of this year, where you saw so many absolute return strategies get hurt for no apparent reason. It wasn't a particularly systemic crisis or anything, but I think it was the issue of stop losses and people experiencing certain losses and trying to liquidate without liquidity being there. So I, that, that's exactly, I think, what yeah. happened in the first three months of this year. That's an excellent point, Vlad. And one of the ways that you can look at it, and we've looked at it, is you take what the portfolio would have done on January 1, rolled it all through the quarter, you give a rough idea. And what you're seeing are numbers that come in way below that because of the trading. So this liquidity that we've been talking about has really been one of the un unintended consequences of all these Basel regulations, as well as um, other, um, you know, the QE that also had, had a negative impact. Um, let's switch gears to the SEC, because now they're looking at this new uh, regulatory proposals for liquidity management and derivative exposure rules. Um, but do you think that these proposals are going to make the industry any safer or, again, lead to additional unintended consequences? Well, well, let me say something I thought I'd never say, which is, thank God it's the SEC looking into it. Because <laughs> at the beginning, when you saw the FSOC's proposals that were coming through, the idea was to treat the mutual fund ETF business like it was a bank, which it, it certainly isn't. In fact, as you force more less risk taking in banks and more capital under the banking system, where do the risks have to go? They have to go to the free markets. And that's what mutual funds and ETFs really are. They're, it's been actually a great success in that individual investors can now get basically the strategies that many institutional investors get. They get them for close to the same price. They get generally very good liquidity. So how much regulation is supposed to be put on here versus disclosure is a hard thing. But there's been a lot of progress. We've, the industry has worked very, very hard with the SEC to go from basically sort of capital requirements for mutual funds that made no sense in defining liquidity. And I, I kind of, liquidity is one of the hardest risks to define out there. And I think a little bit about, about physics when I think about that and, and the, uh, the, uh, the uncertainty principle, which is the more you, if you look at something, you change it. And the sense is that as you try to put your hands around liquidity and you start saying this asset's liquid, this asset's not liquid, you've changed it at that point. You've actually potentially created less liquidity in the marketplace, which is a continuing theme of, of these regulations. Um, where are we ending up? I think we're ending up in an okay place, which is that we've decided that we will have uh, some categorization, some reporting that will lead to disclosure. All that's good. Uh, it looks like a lot of this talk of having a uh, three-day liquidity hurdle is being sort of shelved for a little while and put to the side. These are very hard things to um, define. And another risk that keeps coming up in this is that there was talk of having the managers decide what was liquid and not liquid in their portfolios. And on the surface, that sounds great. But all you need to do is get an upstart firm or a couple upstart firms that decide everything in their portfolio was liquid, regardless of that. They're going to compete by saying, we're the liquidity shop out there. And as soon as that gets disproven, then the whole system once again gets called into question. and You have a new form of systemic risk. So again, uh, kudos to the SEC, I think, for listening to the industry modifying these proposals. And while I don't know that anything more than disclosure is really required, and I think that you do want people to accept the risks of the funds that they invest in. And that gets back to my earlier comment about my kids. Um, funds are going to blow up. Uh, you had, you know, I won't name it, but you had a high yield fund, obviously, underperform. I don't think any professional in the room, and I don't think many investors were in the fund, didn't know that that fund took more risk in that particular market than any of its competitors. It showed in its yield, it showed in its volatility, it showed in everything it did. And so when you have a bad outcome like that, what would Schumpeter say if he was in the room with us? You have to let people accept the consequences of that for the market to work over time. And the regulators should not be in the business. They should be in the business of encouraging disclosure, making sure that investors know what they're getting, but they shouldn't be in the business of preventing bad outcomes like that. Bad outcomes are going to happen, and part of the market, and the market clearing and getting the prices that Myron talked about is letting that process unfold and be unfettered. So there's my, there's my pitch for free markets. <clears throat> so you <laughs> mentioned um, um, okay. different funds differentiating, saying, well, we're liquid um, versus another. What about the size of the fund? Because some of these, the marks, the way they come in, it's for a particular security. 
But if you have these mega funds, obviously you've got less liquidity if everybody's running for the door at the same time. What do you think about that? And, and what do you think about um, funds um, being designated as GCIFIs? Well, I, I certainly don't think funds should be generated, uh, um, designated as GCIFIs. Um, Why is that? Well, I just don't think that they, they, they represent that type of systemic risk uh, that a bank going down does. We're not a transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Well, but there's, We're, two, types of, there's two types of um, systemic risk. You can, you can envision a super large fund that needs to liquidate for whatever reason. Maybe there's a reputational risk issue and everybody decides to exit. Now, if all of those securities are being sold at the same time, you could see a huge market disruption. Well, we, we, we actually saw that happen and there really wasn't much of a market disruption except um, that firm obviously saw their earnings go down. They liquidated quite successfully. But that, wasn't a, that was not a big mega fund. I'm talking about a super, one of these really, we've got you know, several trillion dollar funds out there. So you don't think that there's any kind of knock-on effect? To Trillion the dollar funds. Yeah, there's which, we which, don't want to name names. We don't want to name names. Okay. Um, I think it really depends on what they're investing in and who their investors are at the end of the day. Um, if you're talking about insurance companies, um, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, they're fighting that uh, designation, and um, I think that you know we should look at it. But again. We need to be willing as a society to accept systemic risk. It's going to happen. We're going to have a recession. There's going to be a financial firm that fails in our future. There's going to be a downturn in the credit cycle. Uh, we need to sort of stop pretending that this is candy land and everything's always going to be perfect. And so to regulate that, the cost of that will most likely be higher um, than what you will get basically by preventing one of those disasters from occurring in the future. Okay. You have to keep the banking system healthy, yes. And I think we've done that. Most of the time you're talking, and you're talking about the idea that this liquidity risk is based on the intermediation principle, that the fact is that some people hold assets for over time for intermediation purposes and make money that way, so they're in less liquid assets and securities, and you need to have time, uh, obviously, uh, is the important variable as well. But myriad of our securities that are traded are not those type of assets. Where, you know, and most of them are, are beta type assets where there's huge amounts of liquidity, whether you're trading on funds or, you know, and, and the like. So I, I think that, uh, yes, you're concentrating on the intermediation business, which is part of the banking business. We're talking about investment generally. There's a large class of securities, the largest uh, market value of securities are very liquid, highly liquid in markets and traded very easily. I think that gets to the second rule that they're working on, which uh, I, I have to say uh, my institution hasn't had as much skin in the game, which is the derivatives uh, legislation. But clearly derivatives have been one place that uh, since the financial crisis, people have been able to move large amounts of risk back and forth with, with very strong liquidity. Part of that liquidity has come from a stronger banking system, better rules about margining, clearing houses. And I think we're, we've moved that business again into a pretty good place. And again. The principle is if you look at something, you might change it. Uh, and so to the extent that these derivative legislations are in a little bit earlier phase than the liquidity uh, uh, rules that are being discussed, to the extent that they turn out to be very restrictive uh, and they change the players and they change the designations that players have to use um, for those instruments in their portfolios, there could be some unintended consequences for liquidity in the marketplace, which is something we, you know, we, we have lost a lot of liquidity from the broker-dealer segment uh, because of the rules, uh, and it really hasn't been replaced by the dark pools and the peer-to-peer -peer sort of ideas. And so until there's a solution to that, uh, I think the regulators should be very careful. Myron, um, beating an index is great, but an investor can't pay his bills with negative returns no matter how much he beats the index. And, Somebody mentioned earlier about moving to um, absolute return strategies. And so we've seen some moving away from benchmarking. Can you uh, tell us what's your view in terms of which is going to be riskier? Um, I think that, um, yeah, basically, I think we've talked about, um, here we're talking in the panel as well, but in the past, we think we always thought about investment as, and the investment world is based on how cross-sectionally to allocate as, among assets, right? So, um, and uh, having buckets, and most managers and others are selected on their ability to outperform a benchmark. 
and there are constraints associated with deviating too much from the benchmark and staying close to it. So the problem is that um, that means that uh, diversification is relative to a benchmark, okay, not relative to absolutely to uh, uh, being able to consume something in the future. So the problem is that when we have benchmark investing, then we have to think about who's going to handle the risk and associated with managing risk of a changing benchmark risk. And that beta risk it dominates dramatically any uh, portfolio returns because most of what investment management and measurement has evolved from is based on the assumption that distributions are the same next period as they were last period and also based on averages. And the average is not what we uh, consume in the future. It is the compound return that we consume from. Uh, you, may, you invest today, and you compound over time to have a, a terminal value. Now, you can't take the average return and then uh, take the power of the average return. You're not going to get the compound return. It's going to be that the compound return is going to be less than the average return. And when you think about compound returns, the most interesting thing about compound returns is that the, uh, the distribution comes in and affects compound returns. Volatility is very important. The more excess volatility you take, the less your compound return is going to be. The more negative tails you're going to take, the more skewness you have, the less your compound return is going to be. So when you think about means, or just think about on average, I'm going to get this, my, this is my expected return. That has nothing to do with your terminal wealth. If you experience as an investor a tail loss, it takes a long time to recover from that tail loss. Or you miss a tail gain. It takes a long time to recover from the tail gain. So it's actually risk management is all there is, really, in my view, to having an uh, investment experience that will be uh, the best terminal wealth experience. I'm sure that it's possible to think about uh, selecting various asset classes that are going to give you a greater expected return relative to a benchmark. But investors are now realizing after the 2008 experience that, uh, that cross-sectional diversification is not as important as time series diversification and thinking about how to think about focusing on the components that really maximize your terminal value, which is generated by compound return. And this idea that we have a long horizon and we can keep our buckets constant over time and ignore changing risks is false. Because it's, if you can reduce your loss and by managing risks uh, as they occur, as they anticipatedly occur, then your terminal wealth experience can be much greater. And the interesting part about compound return is that in the short run, it, when you take a loss, it doesn't matter in compound return, because you're multiplying one plus the return. So today, if you end up in the next period losing 50% and then tripling your money thereafter, it's the same thing as tripling your money first and losing 50% in the last period. Your terminal wealth is exactly the same. So that means that every period matters in risk management. Every period matters going forward. And so one of the important things is to focus on how you not only have cross-sectional diversification. If cross-sectional diversification is supposedly free most of the time, then time series diversification or keeping risk constant is also free. In the sense that we hear that if you buy an index fund, it has low fees, it has no tracking error. Uh, but the S&P 500 risk is changing dramatically over time. And so if one has a target level of risk, just investing in an index fund is not risk management. It's, it's investing in an asset that's changing risk dramatically over time. And if you manage risk correctly, uh, you can increase your terminal value and terminal wealth uh, experience. Vlad, do you want to add to that? I know that you were talking earlier uh, about that. Sure. Yeah, no, I agree with a lot of points that Myron has made back on the correlation and the tail risk. And I think one of the 
strategies that some allocators and managers have used over the years and actually have probably gotten disillusioned with at this point is the tail risk strategies. And uh, of course, that sort of, uh, you know, whether dedicated tail risk strategies, whether uh, asset classes like VIX, which people have used for hedging, those things don't really work over the longer period of time because, um, you know, selling insurance is a business, buying insurance is not a business. So you can't really have a strategy in your portfolio which has a positive carry and will provide diversification and hedge in the time of stress and correlations going to one. Um, so I think the only way to create a uh, uncorrelated uh, portfolio of strategies is to embed it at every point of the investment process. So you have to use different data from other uh, investment managers. You have to combine signals in a different way. You have to use different risk um, optimization and portfolio construction methods. And only through doing all of those things differently from others uh, can you achieve some kind of a you know, mitigation uh, in the but time I of stress. I think you can because basically the interesting problem is that everyone is constrained to the benchmark so if everyone's constrained to the benchmark, they're not acting to adjust their risk. Okay? So if you're constrained to the benchmark, that means if you are actively risk managing your portfolio to keep risks, uh, to avoid tail risk, reduce tail risk, keep risks relatively constant, you can produce a superior return. I was referring more to the absolute return strategy, not the benchmark relative. But, uh... Right, I understand. What have the uh, portfolio construction changed um, and evolved post the financial crisis? Do you think there's been changes, and if so, how? Um, I think people have become more sophisticated with the tools they've used, but um, some of the things, so that's progress in the sense that people are becoming more systematic. They are using models. Uh, they are using optimization methods for portfolio construction, but some of it also has, uh, you know, the other side of it, which is if everybody is using the same models and the same tools and the same bar models, then they will all cut and try to reduce risk at the same time. And that, of course, doesn't lead to, to good things. So Jane, what do you see as the main risks in asset management industry facing today? Well, the main risks. <laughs> um, I mean, what I think about and what I see a lot of is meeting with a lot of big asset managers and small asset managers is People do tend to hurt in how they think they should optimally manage money. And surprise, surprise, it's based on recent events. And so, I mean, I think one of the big issues and something we're paying a lot of attention to is a lot of people are, quote, unquote, stress testing their models against 2008. And if everybody's doing that, you're not going to get a 2008. It's going to take place differently. And so I think you need to be very careful and you need to think about who the drivers are in the markets, who needs liquidity, how broad and deep are they, how much pain they're going to take. And you have to really work through that's what I call scenario for looking scenario analysis about people's motivations. What's your view in terms of the biggest risk that you're seeing? Well, I completely agree with, 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 with the perspective that, yes, now everyone bar tests mm -hmm. for the 2008 scenario. So it's not going to be what happened. And I think uh, Myron's been very eloquent about the idea that we look to the past and we can't predict the future. There are tools we can use that are unbiased that may help us have a glimpse of what, what the, is the unbiased view of the future, the risk neutral view of the future. Um, and using those is much better. But I do think we have a huge behavioral problem within the risk management community. I saw this uh, when I did futures in the 80s. There was this ridiculous technical model called like Stratelmeyer or something. And it was a guy who invented it at the pit. And he would put these charts out every morning. And boy, they were completely meaningless. And everyone followed them, so they worked for a while. And I think that the same is true here, that to the extent that uh, everyone follows a VAR type of process, where risk is measured by volatility in very short time periods, um, we're going to get that type of activity. And we saw it fail dramatically in the 2008-2009. Look at the high yield universe of managers out there. Look how many underperformed in 2008 and then underperformed in 2009. But every, everyone knew that VAR was going to fail. I mean, I, they? no, I mean, I don't. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, any academic would tell you that basically at times, if you're thinking about shocks, you know, then the correlations are not going to be 
what a VAR model would say, because all the VAR models were based on historical average and historical volatilities and historical correlations. How can 95, that be? 95%. You're right. And what 90, about the other 5%? Right, exactly. One point. You know, but but, right. but Myron, to your point of looking at the options, right, by the time if you look at, let's say, VIX index as the headline but number VIX, for options, VIX, by VIX the time you look VIX at... Is the, VIX is the... Is, all the correlations in the short term are changing. The volatility of VIX is going to be very large. Because it's, but those correlations don't. I'm mean just saying, use it as a it's proxy. The tail correlations that count. Let me get you thinking about tail. Don't tell me the VIX. <laughs> I'm, I'm, at, I'm making. I don't it. care about the VIX. I, the VIX will have <laughs> lots of faults. Because so you look at a portfolio, the correlations are always the small correlations are always change. The volatility of VIX is going to change, but the volatility of the tail correlations are not going to change. My point is a little bit different. Forget VIX. Just take an average of options, implied volatilities. My point is, by the time it moves, isn't it already too late? You're saying, use it as a predictor of the crisis. No, but the, but the time is, it okay. moves, no, no. If, if, if the world is earthquakes, I agree. So there's no information. There's no information in the past data. There's no information in the future data. If everything's just a shock that occurs, there's no evolution, we can't do anything. But if there's a case that things are evolving over time, and, and people are learning, and you're getting more information as they learn, the prices are telling you things, then you can get information. Another way, another way to think about it, if you're managing a big balance sheet, you're managing a lot of risk, everybody's looking at models. And you should, always, you should always look at models. And models have a role. But every single day, you've got to be testing in real practical application the things that are going on in the market. And so there's been a lot of debate about marking things to market and how that can exacerbate or not exacerbate volatility in markets. But one thing's for sure, if you're managing a balance sheet or you're managing a lot of risk, one way to really know what something's worth is to actually go sell it. And so you can look at models all you want, but if you're not testing every day you know, what it is you have, you don't really know what you have until you actually have to go follow through. And so Jane would say you know, that's, that's, that's another way of what I think Byron's saying, which is you've got to be looking at what the market's saying to you every day, and you've got to put all those experiences together, and you'll still get it wrong when the tails go the wrong way. OK, well, with that, thank you very much to the, uh, our panelists. I think our session has run out of time.